This is Trish, and I'm here to tell you the story of the L.A. Lone Women Murders today. But before we get started on that, I want to let you know I am going to be doing more of these vlogs. I will get it down to a weekly basis instead of a 10 to 14 day basis. I'm not very good at planning out the research, so what I think takes one day ends up taking four or five days. But I will get better, I promise. And after this story, if you like what you hear, please hit the subscribe button and the little bell, and you'll get notifications every time I put up a new vlog. So let's get back to the story. After researching the Black Dahlia murder that I did recently, um, I came across Steve Hodel in the book, The Black Dahlia Adventure 3, which I read. And I also discovered that in that decade, there was a lot of political and police corruption. And there were many murders of women that went completely unsolved. They're unsolved to this day. They were called the victims of the Los Angeles killer, which they considered or the newspapers referred to as a sadistic sexual killer. And I want to talk to you about newspapers. I found this site called newspapers.com. I love it because you get real-time stories with all the details as if you're there that day when it happened. A lot of stuff that gets left out of stories that are told and retold, as we all know. Are the murders of these women connected? Many people believe they're not. I was recently, though, reading a story about the Hillside Strangler in the late 70s. And as I was reading his story and the murders, there was a rhythm to it. And these murders were not identical, but they had enough similarities. You would find common elements with all the sites. And you do with these women also. And a bell went off for me that at least some of these are related. Now, there were a couple in there that I felt like their husbands had something to do with their death. One paper referred to the 29 months after the Black Dahlia's murder as a period of sexual mutilation slangs of attractive women. The author of a site called derangedlacrime.com revealed some other reasons. First, there was a flood of military personnel and war workers during the 1940s. A lot of transients in the Los Angeles area. We were at war. I noticed after reading all those papers from the 40s that that was pretty much true. Forensics were limited at the time, and other than fingerprints, there wasn't a lot of technology in which to solve crime. After the war, there was a mass return of soldiers, many with horrific cases of post-traumatic stress disorders. Not only was it not recognized at the time, the men were literally taught to buck up, be a man, and expected to get on with it. So these fragile men were left roaming the streets with no support whatsoever. And a beautiful woman who told him no or used him to buy her dinner and drinks could be at real risk of violence and ultimately murder. The women are that died and the years are Ora Murray, 1943, Georgette Bowerdoff, 1944, Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, 1947, Jean French, 1947, Laura Trellstad, 1947, Dorothy Montgomery, 1947, Lillian Dominguez, 1947, and I found an additional woman not included in the list. Evelyn Winters in 1947. In 1948, there was Gladys Kern. 1948, there was Mimi Blumhauer. 1948, there was Jean Spangler. And 1949, Louise Springer. To this day, all those murders go unsolved. Over seven decades ago, multiple murders were not called serial killings, but they were chain murders. Let's start with Ora Murray, 42 years old. She is also known as the Gardenia Murder. She and her sergeant husband were both in the military at Camp McCain in Mississippi. She came out west to visit her sister and her husband, Latona and Oswald Lenin. Five days after she arrived, Latona and Ora decided to go dancing at a dance hall. Now, dance halls were prevalent all over the world during World War II. They were a morale booster for both soldiers and the general population. The large dance halls had an orchestra, and the smaller ones had a three-piece band, so they had live music. 
and unlike the reputation of dance clubs today, these were social parlors. Kids from their late teens and early 20s were participants. They were replaced in the 1960s with adult nightclubs that took on a different tone. But these early dance halls were a celebration and raised everyone's spirits during the war. So that night, July 27, 1943, Latona and Ora went dancing at the Zinda Ballroom. And they met these two men there, Preston and Paul. Paul later invited the whole group to take a ride in his flashy blue convertible coupe. Who wouldn't want to go see the lights of Hollywood or L.A.? Preston begged off so he didn't go, but the trio stopped by Latona's house to see if Oswald would come. He also begged off so Latona stayed with him. It would be the last time that Latona would see her sister alive. The next morning about dawn, a 15-year-old kid was helping his groundskeeper father on his rounds at the Fox Hill Golf Course when he discovered Aura, semi-nude and mutilated. She had been strangled, she was covered in bruises and abrasions, and she had shown up in Los Angeles with an injury of three broken ribs. They found a white gardenia tucked under her body, which is why her murder is labeled as the white gardenia murder. Paul was no place to be found. But here's an interesting afternote on Paul. Within days, a 31-year-old woman had come forth and said the Paul they were looking for's name was really Grant W. Terry, and he was her fiancé. Now, they'd had a whirlwind romance of 10 days where he'd proposed to her, and she loaned him $700 in 1947, by the way, and $200 to buy her engagement ring. That night, she also loaned him her brand new blue convertible coupe to drive around in. Now, there's an interesting note about Grant W. Terry. His real name was actually Roger Lewis Gardner, and he was a swindler. He pretended to be a federal attorney, and he would go from military camp to military camp to military camp. He would swindle the women and take their money, their jewels, and then leave town and go on to the next one. He was eventually arrested and sentenced to prison for three years for swindling, but was never charged with the murder of Ora Murray. That murder is still unsolved. Next is Georgette Bauerdorf, 20 years old. She was murdered in her own apartment October 12, 1944. She was the daughter of a rich oil tycoon out of New York City and had moved to be on her own in her own apartment only weeks before her death. The killer in this case planned it out. So they figured that he'd been around the area. He could have been a day worker that worked in the neighborhood, but he planned it out. Outside of apartment in the hallway was a globe lighting the entrance. It was eight feet high. That day he found a way to get eight feet high and turn the globe and so that it was dark outside. Police surmised, like I said, that it was a day worker or somebody around the neighborhood. They would have known she lived alone. Georgette was out at the Hollywood Canteen that night with her friend June Ziegler. Now, canteens were more casual than the ballroom. They were anything from restaurants to social clubs to like lounges. Often during the war, they were on military bases for the servicemen. According to her journal that was retrieved after she was killed, Georgette, like Elizabeth Short, had an affinity for servicemen. Georgette got home about midnight that night, and we know that because the janitor had heard a disturbance coming from Georgette's apartment. Now, he didn't go to check it out that night, but about 2.30, someone in her building also heard a scream, a female cry, stop, you're killing me. Now, it disturbed him so much, he sat straight up in bed, and he said he listened for a while, but he didn't hear anything else and he either assumed it was just a family fight or something and he went back to sleep because he said he was tired. Now in the morning the janitor did take his wife and went up to Georgette's apartment to check on her and that is when they found her floating in the bathtub. 
Now, at first, when the officials, the police, got there, they thought she had fallen in the tub and maybe just hit her head, so they were going to deem it an accident. But somebody asked them to take a second look as they found some additional issues around her. First, she was strangled. Okay. Second, there was part of a towel shoved down her throat. She was also raped and covered in bruises, and she had one large handprint that was located on the inside of her thigh. The killer took $100 and stole her car. He drove it until it ran out of gas and then abandoned it. And the witnesses that night said there had been a swarthy male with dark hair who kept cutting into all of her dances with other men trying to monopolize her time while she was at the cantina. Now, one thing the janitor said, along with the witnesses that knew her, is that Georgia had, had a strict upbringing and she did not entertain men in her apartment. There were fingerprints at the scene also, but even with that, eventually the crime went cold. Elizabeth Short's death on January 15th, 1947, became worldwide one of the most famous unsolved murder cases in the Los Angeles area. That frosty, overcast January 15th morning in 1947, Betty Bersinger had taken her three-year-old and was headed down Norton Avenue toward the cobbler. To the side of the road, she sees what looks to her like a mannequin, a very white mannequin. The closer she gets, she realizes it's the body of a young woman, and not only that, but the body is cut in half. She grabs the stroller, rolls back to the first house she can get to, and calls the police. And that was the discovery of Elizabeth Short's body, later to be known as the Black Dahlia. I've covered this in a blog or a vlog of her own, so I'm gonna encourage you to go back there and not go into it in too much depth here because there are other women that didn't get the fame or the exposure that Elizabeth Short did as the Black Dahlia, and they're the ones I want to talk to you about. The next one in that line is a 45-year-old woman by the name of Jean French. She was discovered on a West L.A. hilltop on February 10, 1947. She had been strangled and trampled to death as if someone kicked her over and over, then stomped on her body. There was a message written across her stomach in her own red lipstick, which is what earned her the name of the Red Lipstick Murder. It stated F-U-P-D. Also, her mouth was slashed at the sides, giving her that same creepy look as it did the Black Dahlia. Many thought it was a, an attempt to sort of mimic the Black Dahlia, not actually the same killer. Jean was a pilot. She had an interesting life for the time that she lived in. She was born in like 1902 or something. So she was a pilot, and after passing her exams, she was part of the Women's Air Force, or Air Reserve is what they called it then. She was a stewardess for Pioneer. She was a bit player in the movies, and both in her public and her military life, she was a nurse. She had gotten married young to a man named David Rather, who was a wealthy oil tycoon out of Houston, and they had one child named David. And upon hearing about her murder, her son absolutely collapsed. At this point in her life, at the time of her death, she was married to a man named Frank F. French. It was her fourth marriage. At that time, she had began to drink. When I did some research on her, I couldn't really find a, a reason, but their marriage was volatile on both sides. Frank was arrested for punching her in the face at one point. He was accused of her murder, but he denied it. She went to visit him hours before she was killed to his apartment. Frank said his landlady would vouch for him that he didn't leave after that. And he passed a lie detector test, so the police moved on. The case eventually went cold and now is associated with the Black Dahlia murder. The next woman along this list is Laura Eliza Trillstead. She was 37 and the mother of three young children. On May 12, 1947, she was brutally murdered. 
She was found on the side of the road. Somebody had just like dumped her and it appeared her clothes had been sort of hurled at her and she had no identification. But an ID was made from a mark on her coat from a laundry. They were able to trace it back. She was hit on the head and strangled to death with a belt from men's pajamas. When they found her, she was still warm to the touch, so her death had been very recent. The night before, she and her husband were playing cards with friends. Her husband wanted to continue, and the women were bored. So she said, if you boys can play poker, we girls can go dance. The other women ended up not wanting to go with her, but she decided to head out on her own to the Crystal Ballroom. It was the last anybody saw of her. Her husband, whose name was Ingman Trellstad, identified her at the morgue the next morning. And as he talked to the police, he said that after the game, he went home, he fed his children, and he waited to see if she came home, and then he went to bed. When the police asked why he did not go looking for her, he, he said he had nobody to leave the children with. This murder was never solved. At this point, papers from around the country were calling her the third victim in the sadistic sex slangs in Los Angeles. They were including the murder of one Evelyn Winters, 43, alias Victoria Wyndham. She was a Vassar educated woman who worked as a studio musician and a former copywriter there. She was stabbed in the eye and strangled March 11, 1947. She was discovered by a, a young man who kissed her dead mouth but swore he did not kill her. An interesting side note about the Trellstad murder, in fact, about Ingman Trellstad, is that I found this blog with comments about her murder. It was called 1947project.com. And a woman saying that she was her granddaughter, Laura's granddaughter, was on there discussing it. Now, the woman's name was Jen Thornhill, and she was the daughter of Audrey, who was eight at the time of her mother's murder. And she said that it came out the next day her father, Ingman, asked the five-year-old daughter, Janet, to bury the shoe in the backyard and never discuss it again. Now, after her death, Jen said the children were sent to separate relatives, and they stayed that way until 1986 when they made contact. And it appears as if the father had almost no contact with them whatsoever after the mother died. It was then that Janet revealed the shoe incident in 1986 when they got together. They also had a brief connection to their father before he died, but he failed to mention that he went on and had a whole second family. He married again and had children. Today, an apartment complex was built on the site that their family home sat on. So there is no possibility of digging up that shoe to see whether it existed or not. The next woman I want to talk to you about, his name is Dorothy Montgomery. She was 36, and she was found Saturday, May 3rd, 1947, under a pepper tree. She was the mother of three, and she had been missing since 9.30 p.m. the previous evening. She left her home to go pick up her daughter, May Seal, 15, at a dance recital in the playground. She was strangled, she was nude and beaten, and the newspapers referred to her as another Southland mutilation murder victim. She was discovered about 10.30 in the morning by a man named G.W. Thomas. He lived across the street and was repairing his car when he noticed a white kind of flapping thing under the pepper tree and went to investigate. Dorothy was not killed under the pepper tree, but was transported there after her death. Her husband was eventually arrested and tried for the murder. Now, her children that she had were from another marriage, and they testified against him, the stepfather, at trial. Even so, he was acquitted. To this day, the crime still remains unsolved. This next story is a really sad and a little bit unnerving story, especially considering we're talking about 1947. 
Lillian Dominguez was walking with her sister Angie. Lillian was 15, Angie was 17, and Angie's friend, Andrea Marquez, who was also 17. They were in Santa Monica, and they had just been to the dance. Now, Lillian was walking slightly behind the other two older girls when a man came out of the dark and just approached them, and they brushed up against Lillian, kind of poked her, and then moved on. Within about 30 seconds, Lillian shouted, He touched me! Seconds later, she yelled, I can't see! And then she fell to the ground dead. It seems the touching that he did is that he stabbed her with a stiletto knife or an ice pick to the heart from behind between her second and third ribs. This was October 2nd, 1947. One week later, October 9th, a note on the back of a business card was left under the door of an L.A. furniture store. The message was written in pencil. It read, I killed the Santa Monica girl. I will kill others. Now, Steve Hodell, the Black Dahlia 3, Avenger 3, includes her murder with the other L.A. women. Most authors did not when I was looking. The Lillian Dominguez murder occurs two miles from Jean French, where Jean French was found, the red lipstick murder. Six of these murders have notes left with significant or unusual signatures. Hodel has a theory that these murders may be related eventually to the Zodiac Killer, a topic for another blog. Gladys Kern was 42. She was a real estate broker who was stabbed in the back with a hunting knife while showing a house. As Gladys left her office that afternoon, a woman working in a small laboratory behind the real estate office saw her with a large man, six feet plus, 200 pounds plus, with a long, full face. At some point that afternoon, she was also seen with a man at the counter of a drugstore. Today, we would probably call this a meeting. He was about 5'10", dark curly hair. Neither of these men were identified. During the murder, the killer stole her little black book of appointments, which probably would have identified him. He rinsed the knife, wiped it with a handkerchief, balled it up, and left them both behind. Within hours, there was an alibi letter mailed to the police. Really, it was dropped in a mailbox in a sealed envelope, and on the back was written, Hurry, give this to the police. It was the killer's version of what happened to Gladys Kern. He said he met a prize fighter about three weeks ago. He persuaded him to front a home in Los Feliz, a restricted area at the time. An appointment was made with a real estate agent for Saturday. He drove the woman and the prize fighter to the house. After, he waited for a time, and he became suspicious when nobody came out, and he went inside. There he saw the prize fighter hunched over the woman. The man covered the prize fighter with a revolver he had with him, tied him to the sink with his belt, and left. He said he needed to find that man as that was his alibi. Gladys's murder went unsolved. Jean Spangler was 27, an aspiring actress, who was actually working, and she was waiting in a downtown lot in her car. She was abducted along with the car, bludgeoned, strangled with a cloth strip, sodomized with a finger-thick 14-inch branch. She was found in an entrance to Griffith Park at 7 a.m. by groundskeeper Henry Anger, October 7, 1949. Her white purse was thrown to the side with the straps torn. The Los Angeles Times said the dark-haired, blue-eyed actress kissed her daughter, Christine, the night before, winked at her sister-in-law, and walked calmly out of her Hollywood home and into the night, never to be seen again. Jean was not yet a star, but she was a showgirl, and she was also getting acting parts on television, so she was working. She was well-liked. Robert Cummings, the famous actor at the time, said she had started dating somebody new. She had a good group of friends, and she was a devoted mother to her five-year-old daughter, Christine. She divorced Dexter Benner in 1946 and had sole custody of her daughter, and they both lived with her mother in Hollywood. 
Now that week, her mother had gone to visit a son in Kentucky, and she had a premonition before she left. She felt like was something was going to happen and that she shouldn't go. But like many of us, she just dismissed the small, still voice. Her sister-in-law, Jean, was staying with her, helping her with Christine, so all of that her bases were covered. She left the house stating she was going to meet her husband, her ex-husband, Dexter, to discuss increasing her support. Dexter denied he was going to meet with Jean, and he said he was at home all night with his brand new wife, Lynn, who gave him an alibi. Jean was seen around a market between 5 and 6 p.m. A woman named Lillian Marks, who works at a stall in the market, said she appeared to be walking around like she was waiting for somebody that never arrived. Two days later, she was found in Griffith Park. There was an exhaustive investigation with no results. The sad thing was a cop was quoted in the paper when he said, this girl really got around. It was August 18, 1949. Mimi Bloomhauer's husband had died years ago. She was a 48-year-old widow who lived alone in 1949. Her lifestyle was changing. Her money was dwindling. She pawned the items to keep up the facade of her previous life when she was married. She sat at her table getting ready to eat. What was found later is an uneaten salad. Her lights were left on and her front door wide open. But where was Mimi? Novice Bloomhauer was a big game hunter. He was wealthy and very social. And when he was alive, he made sure that Mimi sported big diamonds on her fingers. That day, she was wearing $25,000 worth of jewels, equivalent to about 260000 in 2019. She was supposed to meet a girlfriend, Stella Hunter. Stella had to cancel at the last minute due to a business meeting. Five days after her disappearance, her white handbag was found in a telephone booth next to a supermarket in Los Angeles. On the side was scrawled, We found at beach Thursday night. Upon examination, the purse showed no evidence of salt water or sand, but she was never seen again. Seven years later, 1956, they declared her legally dead, and her estate at that point was worth $619 in cash and about $25,000 in government bonds. June 13, 1949, Louise Springer, 28, was found in the back of her husband's convertible sedan. She had been garroted with a length of clothesline that had been knotted. Her face was swollen and nearly black. Her skirt and her clothes were twisted around her body, and a stick 14 inches long and a quarter inch thick was shoved up into her body. Louise Springer had her own beauty shop in Los Angeles, and her husband Lawrence said that evening she'd closed up shop and he went to pick her up from work. She had changed into her slippers and got all comfortable in the car, then remember she'd forgotten her prescription glasses, so he volunteered to go over to the drugstore and get them for her. When he came back, she was gone. That is his story. When the police investigated the scene and investigated her, they determined there was no dirt, dust, or stains on her shoes and that she had never left the car. Her murder took place on 38th Street only two blocks from where the black dahlia was found. Witnesses described that a young man later identified as Ralph Kyle, he was 23, was getting out of the Springer's car and then walking quickly down the street. Kyle was a former submarine electrician in the war, but at this point he was jobless and homeless and he slept in his car, but he still liked to wear his uniform. Turned out that Ralph Kyle had an alibi and was released from custody. The cord in his car also did not match the one on Louise's neck. Lawrence Springer and his friend Benny Moritz went to the coroner's office to ID Louise. Springer himself couldn't do it, so he had Benny do it. Guilty conscience, maybe? I don't know. Louise closed up her shop in the evening and then waited for the bus at the same place. She once told her husband, Lawrence, you know, I certainly get a lot of offers for rides when I wait at that bus stop. Perhaps Mr. Springer didn't like that. 
The torture murder of Mrs. Springer left the police baffled at this point. They had nine attractive women, beginning with a black dahlia, that had created 29 months of terror in Los Angeles. This case also remains unsolved. Many people believe these murders are related by the same person. What do you think? I think a few husbands that I wrote about fit the bill. I found it especially interesting, the blog that I discovered that Jen Thornhill, the granddaughter of Laura Trellstad, commented on. As I stated before, she told the story of how her father had her little sister Janet, who was five at the time, bury a shoe in the backyard and never tell anyone. Until 1986, she kept the secret. Now, there were others. There's a couple of others that I discovered, probably more. I came across Viola Norton. She was 36 and was abducted by two men February 14, 1948. She was bludgeoned, slashed, and dumped for dead. The magic of this is she was the only survivor of the attacks. She survived. Marion Newton was not so lucky. She was also 36, and she was a Canadian divorcee whose badly beaten body was dumped on Tory Pines Mesa 12 hours after she was seen with a swarthy man wearing a sombrero that said Sugar Daddy. There are commonalities to the crimes. Strangulation, beating, the assault with a stick, notes to the police on a few. Until I read the story, like I said, of the Hillside Strangler, I wouldn't believe these were related. Now I'm not so sure. In fact, I think there may have been more than one killer. I also believe a couple of men killed their wives. Now these were the parents of baby boomers at a time in the United States of great economic growth, optimism, and a potential to fulfill the American dream. All set with the backdrop in LA, a thriving metropolis, all these horrific crimes took place. Now if you like this, please click the subscribe button and I will produce more of these. Hopefully one a week, but I'm in school and also I'm really learning how to research. So the truth is it will improve. Thank you for listening and leave your comments below and have a good one.